Hello and Yali Madad, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Farah Manjiani, and I will be the moderator for today's Critical Conversation. The Critical Conversation series has been conceived as an ITHRAB USA initiative aimed at engaging the entire Jamaat, but with a particular focus on 18 to 40 year olds. This series aims to explore the critical questions of our time within the context of our faith. Now, before we begin, I'd like to read a land acknowledgement. Land acknowledgements are formal statements that seek to recognize and respect indigenous peoples as original stewards of their land and the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. We do this to express gratitude and appreciation to those whose territory we reside on and to honor the indigenous people who have been living with and caring for their lands from time immemorial. Recognizing them also means acknowledging the historical and ongoing genocide of indigenous peoples and the ways in which we benefit from and perpetuate violence towards indigenous peoples. Naming the original and current stewards of the land we live on is a first step towards making reparations. I reside in Chicago, Illinois, located on the traditional unceded homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi nations. Many other tribes such as the Miami, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Sac, and Fox also call this area home. We believe the work we do in sessions like these is part of our responsibility to acknowledge and address the ongoing harm to indigenous peoples. It's part of our work towards a society that is more just, more equitable, and in keeping with the ethics as Ismaili Muslims. Now, in our session today, we're talking with the author M. Ali Lakani on his book entitled Faith and Ethics, The Vision of the Ismaili Imamat. And we'll explore with him the metaphysical connection between the work that our Imam completes through the AKDN and Jamaati institutions and the underpinnings of Islam, as well as how we can replicate the same understandings in all aspects of our lives. And for our audience today, during the session, you'll see a Q&A box where you can share additional questions and thoughts during the presentation. And we'll try to address as many questions as we get during today's talk as we can. And with that, I am so honored to introduce you to our wonderful speaker for today's session. Rai Saheb M. Ali Lakani Casey is a legal scholar, teacher, and author. He read law at Cambridge University in England, both as an undergraduate and a postgraduate before moving to Canada. He's practiced law as a barrister in Vancouver for 45 years at all levels, including the Supreme Court of Canada. In honor of his legal skills, he received the distinction and the designation King's Counsel. Mr. Lakani has served on many inst Ismaili institutions since his first Imamat appointment in 1984, including as member for education on the National Council for Canada and as the first chair for CAB in Western Canada. His current office is as the Canadian member on the International Conciliation and Arbitration Board or ICAB, and he also chairs the International Ismaili Personal Law Task Force and is also the primary author of the Guidelines for Ethical Wealth Transfer and Inheritance Planning. Mr. Lakani's interest in metaphysics and religion led him 25 years ago to find the, pub the publication Sacred Web, a journal of tradition and modernity, the leading journal in its field. Now in its 50th volume, Sacred Web has been endorsed by, among others, King Charles III, the Dalai Lama, and professors Saeed Hussein Nasser, William Chittick, and Karen Armstrong. In 2001, Mr. Lakani won the first prize for his paper on the Muslim Foundations of Justice based on the writings of Imam Ali, which he presented at the Imam Ali International Conference in Tehran. That paper, along with the second prize paper by IIS scholar Reza Shah Kazemi, were stated by Dr. Nasser to be among the best writings on Imam Ali in the English language. They are published in the anthology, The Sacred Foundations of Justice in Islam. Mr. Lakani is the author of four books on metaphysics and religion, including the one that we'll be discussing today, his study of Molina Hajimam's ideas, titled Faith and Ethics, The Vision of the Ismaili Imamah. That book was published in 2018 on the occasion of the Imam's Diamond Jubilee by the Institute of Ismaili Studies. Mr. Lakani has also made presentations on the Imam's ideas to the Tenemos Academy 
at the Royal Asiatic Society in London, England, and at the Senate of Canada, and he's written on the subject for the Doha Institute. Lastly, I'd like to note that the views of our speaker expressed during this course are his discussion of, are his own. And with that, we are ready to turn to our conversation. Thank you so much for joining us to, here today, Ali. We really appreciate your time and your insights on this. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you very much, uh, Farah. And I would like to thank you and the organizers of this event. And uh, let me just say that uh, we should all spare a thought and a prayer for our fellow brothers and sisters in the uh, human tragedy that's unfolding in Turkey and Syria. Yes, yes, thank you for calling that out. Now, before we get into the weeds of the book, I am very curious to hear about your motivations for writing the book. How did you go about researching and, and writing it? Well, um, this wasn't a commission that I sought, so I didn't really have even any plans to write a book. What had happened was that uh, in volume 34, I think it was, of Sacred Web, I had, for the first time, written about uh, the Ismaili Imam. I had, up to that point, generally left the field uh, to the scholars of the Institute of Ismaili Studies, but, um, I did write one essay on it, and um, it seemed to arouse some interest uh, at the Institute, which uh, prompted uh, an invitation to be sent to me to develop that essay into what was in initially envisaged to be a monograph. When I got the invitation, I thought uh, I would, I didn't want to basically repeat myself. Um, and what I wanted to do was to write more extensively about the ideas of the Imam. Mm -hmm. And so I proposed writing a bigger um, piece, uh, the book, Faith and Ethics. I was given um, six weeks to do it. I suppose uh, the th thinking at the Institute was that six weeks would be enough to convert an article into a monograph. I took the deadline seriously and I researched the book um, by reading all of the public speeches that I could find uh, of uh, Prince Karim Aga Khan, um, mostly online on nano wisdoms. I um, indexed them and, uh, and as I was doing that, um, the themes of the book uh, and the structure of the book uh, began to clarify in my mind. And then I spent the last two weeks of the six week uh, deadline writing the book. Um, the uh, structure of the book, well, let me just say a bit about the theme. In uh, the Iran paper that you referred to uh, in your introduction of me, um, that paper was titled The Metaphysics of Human Governance, Imam Ali, Truth and Justice. And I focus on the terms truth and justice, because what uh, appeared to me from my readings of the summaries of uh, Imam Ali's wisdom was that right from the outset, the uh, main theme um, of the uh, Imamate was truth and justice. And in the case of um, reading Hazraman's speeches, I found that that same theme was evident in, in his uh, public statements, but it might be better to um, uh, re-articulate them as being faith and ethics. So truth and faith, uh, justice and uh, ethics were essentially the sort of cognates. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the structure of the book was concerned, um, I started out by you know, essentially in the first chapter talking about who the Ismailis are, who the Imam is and what the role of the Imam is. And then I moved on to writing about uh, the ethical foundations uh, of, um, of the faith. The next two chapters, I dealt with issues of modernity and modernism, um, you know, changes in the modern world and, and how our faith principles and values engage with them. Um, and then I dealt with uh, uh, 
pluralism and the cosmopolitan ethic, which seem to be very important in the um, uh, public statements of the Imam. The two chapters after that, I dealt with essentially stress factors uh, within humanity, firstly within the Ummah and secondly between Islam and the West, and then uh, looked at the Imam's approach to those. And then in the next two chapters, I looked at um, uh, how the Imam goes about trying to cultivate an enabling environment for the ethics of our faith and how we actually um, institutionalizes and encourages the living of the ethics of one's faith. And in the final chapter, I took a stab at, uh, you know, looking at his, uh, his legacy. Um, so that essentially was how the book came to be written. Yeah, thank you for going through that. And I'm excited to unpack some of that in our upcoming, the rest of the conversation. Now, I know in the preface, you, you mentioned that you chose a metaphysical lens to understand the vision of the Ismaili Imamat. Before diving into all of this, can you explain and articulate to us what is a metaphysical lens and why you chose to adopt that particular approach? Yes, of course. Um, so, you know, a lot of these kinds of books um, uh, can take different kinds of approaches. You know, it could have been biographical, it could have been sociological, it could have been just a, a book that looked at the existing institutional structures. Um, and so the, the issue was, you know, uh, I wanted to avoid all of that. I wanted to take the kind of approach that um, the Imam himself takes. Now the Imam takes a principial approach. This is indicated by um, his having the um, authority of Tawil. Tawil is um, a word that is related to the term awal or principles or first principles. And so the, uh, uh, given that the Imam's approach was principial and not dictated, for example, by academic or ideological fashions, I wanted to make sure that I too avoided um, the, you know, the usual kinds of approaches. Now, you asked what is metaphysics? Metaphysics, as uh, Dr. Sedlis and Nasser, um, the uh, professor at George Washington University and uh, Eminence Grise in this area has stated, metaphysics is the science of the real. And the reality that he is uh, speaking of and metaphysicians speak of is a reality on many different levels. It's not a reality that limits itself to the reality of the uh, materialistic worldview that science, for example, uh, engages with. It incorporates the level of um, uh, the spirit of the spirit, the transcendent order, and therefore of verticality and the sacred. And um, why I ad adopted the metaphysical lens was because values ultimately derive from and embed principles. And those principles were important for me to examine. This is what the Imam speaks about, and I thought it was important to lay out what those principles were. Thank you for sharing that. That leads really nicely into another question that I have. You also start the book with a beautiful poem by Saadi of Shiraz, and if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to read it to you and have you comment on it. Um, it Bani <laughs> Adam is the title of it. The sons of Adam are limbs of each other, having been created of one essence. When the calamity of time affects one limb, the other limbs cannot remain at rest. If you have no sympathy for the troubles of others, you are unworthy to be called by the name of a human. Why did you choose this particular poem as the book's ep epigraph? And how does that tie to the theme of faith and ethics? Um, yes, I gave a lot of thought to actually selecting that particular verse because I, I think it is uh, illustrative of um, the main principles and, and values uh, that engage us in being human, as, as Sadi puts it. Um, one of the phrases that he uses there is that humanity is created of one essence. Um, and uh, 
Hazraman has said that a verse that is central to his life, the first verse of the Surat al-Nisa uh, says that humanity is created from a single soul. Um, now, this is important because what it shows is that we are integrally interconnected. This goes back to the notion of Tawheed, the idea that Islam is all encompassing, that there is um, a metaphysical dimension at which uh, we share the same being. Um, and if we share the same being, as Sadi goes on in the Bani Adam verse, you know, he uses the, the example of um, a, a human body, the network of a human body. And he says that, you know, if, you're, if one of your limbs was being um, uh, hurt, um, of course, your whole body would feel it. And so we should, in the same way, if we are truly human, feel what other people's uh, hurts are. Uh, we should have empathy. So um, the, the, the verse illustrates the uh, integral connection between faith and ethics that lies at the heart of human nature, which is something that I mentioned actually in the first sentence of the book. Um, and it shows that um, we are part of uh, a sacred web, part of a wholeness, um, as, and so our self really, what we consider our, our deepest self is really uh, what in metaphysics is called a microcosm uh, of a universal oneness that exists as a macrocosm. So um, there is a connection, a very, very deep connection uh, that makes, the, makes life a sacred web. And Sadi goes on, to say that if you don't have that connection, then you are not worthy of being called a human. Mm -hmm. And so the essence of humanity is to live in a way that is humane. Um, and I'll, I'll just say something about the word human itself. It uh, comes from a root which is also present in the word humus. Uh, or the soil that makes things grow. Um, it is a very lowly uh, a component in the earth, uh, but it is a vital component in the earth. And the word Adam for the first man uh, means in its original etymology, Adama, clay. Um, again, the idea that to be human is to have the, um, the, the humility, that will uh, enable us to uh, nurture like humus does. Um, so, you know, these, these are very rich themes and I thought that the Benny Adam verse brought them out. Can you say a little bit more about how the verse addresses humility as you just mentioned? Yes, humility in the sense that, you know, the, um, the topsoil, the humus, uh, that which um, uh, nurtures um, what we want to cultivate um, uh, exists on earth as opposed to, uh, you know, uh, uh, forcing things. It, it, uh, it helps cultivate. And to be a human means that we have to um, be in the same spirit as that which nourishes and cultivates. Now, one of the key uh, components or elements, I should say, of, um, of the spirit is uh, Rahma. Rahma, uh, which is uh, an Arabic term uh, denoting the idea of uh, a womb-like love, uh, a nurturing um, a matrix. And, um, uh, this is an essential quality uh, of, of the spirit. It is uh, the way that we understand God. Um, God is uh, he who has uh, prescribed Rama as a law unto himself, and his Rama uh, encompasses everything, uh, as the Quran teaches us. 
So this idea of a divine matrix um, is something that we can only approach when we have the humility to do that. The minute that we interpose our own uh, egos and our own narrow sense of self, um, we move away from the spirit of Rahma. Hmm. Thank you for elaborating on that. It strikes me that oftentimes when we think about faith and ethics and, and we try to describe it in this way, there is a very dini or spiritual approach to it. And yet you've, you've included a passage in the book that explains a little bit more of a direct link between deen and dunya. And if you don't mind, I'd like to read that passage um, out loud. As the Imam of the Ismailis, the Aga Khan is both their spiritual and temporal leader. His dual role, which is to secure the spiritual and material well-being of the Jama'at, derives from Islam's integrated view of life. As he has often noted, Islam rejects the Augustinian division between the spiritual and the temporal and its misgivings about the material realm, instead maintaining a view that seeks to balance spirit and matter, faith and world, or deen and dunya. Consequently, Islam holds that one cannot legitimately forsake the other, forsake the one for the other, but must strive instead to maintain a proper balance between the two. In the words of the Ismaili Imam, man must not shy away from the material endeavor in the name of his faith. It is for this reason that Islam is said to be a way of life, a way of bringing one's faith into the world by living its ethics. Can you elaborate on this passage and explain the connection between the deen and dunya, especially as we think about the imamat's work at large? Well, this goes to the heart of the title of the book, Faith and Ethics. Um, and maybe I should just uh, start by saying a little bit about what I mean by those terms, uh, faith and ethics. So um, faith is, a, as I see it, a form of intelligence. Uh, this may come as a surprise to many people who think that, you know, uh, faith is irrational. Mm -hmm. uh, faith is not irrational, it is supra-rational. And that is to say, it engages our intelligence to the optimal level. And it is at that optimal level that we are able to discern the wholeness that connects us and contains us. Uh, there is a famous phrase that Pascal uses in his Pensées, uh, where he says, the heart is reasons which reason does not comprehend. And there is also a, a famous passage from St. Anselm of uh, the Bishop of Canterbury. Um, uh, in Latin, it is credo ut intelligam, uh, that I believe in order to understand. And there is what I'm pointing to here is a dialectic of faith and intellect. Now, when I use the term intellect, I, I mean to distinguish it as Rumi does from the term reason. Um, Rumi, for example, has in one of his poems, uh, the analogy of, um, he says that, you know, there's two kinds of, um, of reason. Uh, one works like a plumbing device, um, drawing things from the outside within. Um, and the other, which he contrasts it with, works like a fountain overflowing from inside to the out. The latter is the intellect, the former is, is reason. Mm. Now, the intellect is, as Nasser, Seydus and Nasser in, in his Gifford lectures, um, uh, uh, wrote, uh, this is knowledge and the sacred, the book, knowledge and the sacred, that knowing is ultimately connecting with being. Intellect is ontological, you know, um, knowledge is truly uh, ontological means to do with being. And so, so knowledge is ontological before it is logical. It is to do with being. There must be somebody who actually is the knower and conscious uh, before you can exercise even reason. So ultimately, faith is a way of knowing the ground of our being, the sacred. And that is why, as the Imam states, the intellect is a facet of one's faith. 
Um, there's also a passage from Surah Yunus, um, verse, this is the 10th Surah, verse 100, um, which says that no human being can attain uh, to faith except by the leave of Allah. And it is God who will ordain disbelief for those who do not use their innate intelligence. So we must knock on the door, the door of grace, for that door to be opened. We must use our own intellect, which is why I said faith was intelligence, but it is a supra-rational intelligence. I also use the term ethics, and so I'm going to comment on the passage that you just quoted, because um, the word ethics uh, is also uh, present in that passage. Uh, th so the term ethics is different to the term morals. Um, there was a, uh, I remember from many years ago, there was a, a comment made by Lawrence Darrow in his Alexandria Quartet, uh, one of his gnomic sayings, um, <laughs> that morality is nothing if it is merely a form of good behavior, he says. Um, well, <laughs> what that points to is the idea that there is uh, uh, a way of looking at uh, virtue of what is uh, right and wrong, of what is good or not good in the world, that has to come from a worldview. And that worldview is an ethos. So ethics denotes the idea of an ethos. And that ethos is an ethos of wholeness. And wholeness in the sense of not um, the whole being the sum of its parts, but greater than the sum of its parts, so that there is space for grace, for that which is sacred, um, a sacred web of an ever renewing theophany that is the matrix of Rama. Um, now, at the end, I suppose, ethics boils down to love. Love was the motive force of creation, as a famous uh, hadith uh, indicated. Um, and the freedom that we have to live in this world is not fettered, uh, except, you know, uh, that we uh, do things to fetter it and bring upon us um, God's wrath. Uh, freedom is a gift given to us for the sake of love. There is a, a saying from uh, an aphorism from uh, Rabindranath Tagore, which I like to quote in this context, where, he's, where he says, I love my God because he gives me the freedom to deny him. So this notion that, you know, if we are to love, uh, love has to be voluntary. And that is why we are given freedom. But freedom can also be abused. Um, so we have to be careful about that. I'll tell you an anecdote. Um, when I was um, at the signing of the uh, Divan, uh, designation document in Lisbon in uh, 2018 at the end of the Diamond Jubilee. Um, shortly after that uh, signing, uh, uh, I had a short meeting with Hazrimam uh, with a group of colleagues of mine who serve on the uh, International Conciliation and Arbitration Board. And the discussion, of course, was um, how can we uh, do more to uh, encourage people to resolve disputes amicably. And I said, Kodavin, what we don't do is teach the principles. And Hazraman paused for a moment, thought about it, and then said, that all comes down to love. And that's a pretty profound and significant statement. Um, again, it illustrates what I'm trying to say about ethics. Uh, and there is a, a hadith of the prophet, um, the Holy Prophet, which says no one is a true believer until you love for your brother what you love for, your, for yourself. Um, so now let me just turn more directly to the passage that you quoted, which contains the phrase, Islam's integrated view of life. And I think that is, that is a key there. This points to Tawheed, to the wholeness uh, that I've been speaking about, and that wholeness entails the idea of wholesome living. And so the ethics is a balancing. It is a balancing between 
the spiritual world and the material world. And if, if you recall, of course, um, we are not just bodies or minds. We are spiritual beings that are clothed in bodies and minds. And if we live in a world, that world is not merely um, a physical world or a psychic world. It is a spiritual world. And so what the Imam says is that to live in an integrated way, we have to balance these two. There is a quote from him uh, that I have quoted in the book, and let me just see if I can find it very quickly. Um, yes, here it is. Um, it's on page 61 of my book, and he says, the day we no longer know how, nor have the time, nor the faith to bow in prayer to Allah, because the human soul that he has told us is eternal, is no longer of sufficient importance to us to be worthy of an hour of our daily working profit-seeking time, will be a sunless day of despair. So this sense that we must not forget the spiritual realm, even though we're living in a material realm, that we must balance the two is very important. And there's another important thing that I need to bring out from this passage you, that you quoted, because he uses the words din and dunya. Um, that is, uh, din mean the word, meaning the realm of faith and dunya, the material realm that we live in, the world. Um, but why, what I wanted to say about this is that one of the Imam's definitions of ethics is that it is the bridge between din and dunya. It is, it is the way that we bring our, um, our faith into the world. We have to live the ethics of our faith. Yeah, it, it strikes me that as we, we talk about our traditions, but also sort of the evolution of our thinking with how we think about our ethics, how we think about love as sort of the fundamental core of all of it. I'm, I'm curious how modernism plays a role in all of this and impacts progress and change uh, in general. And you write about this in, in your book as well. And there's, there's one more piece of the book I'd like to read out loud. And for anybody following, I'm on page 44. Um, you quoted um, Hazrat Imam at the Sirath conference in Karachi, Pakistan in, in 1976, and you wrote, or you quoted, I have observed in the Western world a deeply changing pattern of human relations. The anchors of moral behavior appear to have dragged to such depths that they no longer hold firm the ship of life. What was once wrong is now simply unconventional, and for the sake of individual freedom must be tolerated. What is tolerated soon becomes accepted. Contrarily, what was once right is now viewed as outdated, old fashioned, and is often the target of ridicule. In the face of this changing world, which was once a universe to us, is now no more than an overcrowded island, confronted with the fundamental challenge to our understanding of time, surrounded by a foreign fleet of cultural and ideological ships which have broken loose. And I ask, do we have a clear, firm, and precise understanding of what Muslim society is to be in, a, in times to come? And if, I, if, as I believe, the answer is uncertain, where else can we search then in the Holy Quran and in the example of Allah's last and final prophet? I'm curious how you think modernism and, and what the Imam is saying in this impacts how we think about our, our current faith and ethics and the change and progress that we are attempting to make in the world? That's a very good question. And um, that's a favorite passage of mine from uh, Hasriman's speeches. Um, so let me just uh, talk about the term modernism um, because it, it's often misunderstood. There's a distinction between modernity, which is the state of living in the contemporary world, 
And there's no value judgment associated with that. It's just a state, the state of living in the modern world, the state of contemporaneity, if you like. And modernism, which implies an ethos, which implies a worldview, and it is the worldview that is cut off from the sacred, from the transcendent, from what the Quran calls the wajala, the faith, the face of God. Um, the Quran teaches that wherever you look, there is the face of God. It teaches that the world is a theophany. If, however, the world that you see is a world without the face of God, the world without spirit, a world only of matter, then we're into the realm of modernism. There is, a, um, there is another speech of Hazrimam's, and it was his Columbia address, and I think that was 2006, where he says, if freedom of religion deteriorates into freedom from religion, then he, he says, I, I fear all will be lost. Um, you know, we will be, he says, on a bleak and, and barren landscape without a moral compass, uh, without any roadmap, without any sense of direction. Now, modernism is my term, uh, which is uh, not a term I've coined, it is a term that I use in this particular way, and it's often used in this way among uh, uh, metaphysicians uh, from the traditional school of thought. Um, <clears throat> if you go back to the passage that you quoted, um, there are some very, very key phrases there. Um, he talks about, the Imam talks about um, the anchors of moral behavior appear to have dragged to such depths that they no longer hold firm the ship of life. Um, and if you think about the world that we live in today, you can see how prescient this was in 1976 when he was. Um, warning really where we were headed and then he says how this happens what was once wrong and we can think of many things that were considered wrong back in the 1970s that are not considered wrong today he says what was once wrong is now simply unconventional and for the sake of individual freedom must be tolerated so we can't criticize certain things today because we're seen to be treading on certain people's freedom, certain people's rights. What is tolerated soon becomes accepted, he says. So once, you know, this, he's talking about a sense of shifting norms. I once wrote an essay in Sacred Web titled, What is Normal? And I answered that question in the traditional way by saying that which is normal is that which connects us with the God-given norm within us. That idea one will find in the Surah Al-Rum, the 30th Surah of the Quran, of the Holy Quran in verse 30, which says that we must set our own face to our um, God-given nature, the fitra. And it goes on to say that we must make sure that that fitra is not corrupted in any way. And that is the true purpose of religion, but most people know it not. I've quoted this in, in the book somewhere. But when we forget what the true norm, the inner norm is, and we look to defining the norm in outward terms, then we fall into the trap of what the Imam is describing here. What is tolerated soon becomes accepted. And he goes on to say, contrarily, what was once right is now viewed as outdated, old fashioned, and is often the target of ridicule. So he's, 
He's saying that fashions govern norms in the outer world, but we must seek a deeper norm. We must seek the norm of the fitra. He goes on then to say, in the face of this changing world, which was once a universe to us and is now no more than an overcrowded island. Now that's interesting. The notion of a universe is that which is um, a whole. It is the idea of the whole that is greater than the sum of its parts, which is infinite. Um, and that is a very, very different notion to the idea of an island, an overcrowded island at that. So we have given up the idea of infinity, he is saying, and replaced it with the sense of the, a smaller universe, which is a material world and an island. And then he goes on confronted with a fundamental challenge to our understanding of time. What is he speaking about there? What is this challenge to our understanding of time? Our understanding of time, as he says, actually it's on the next page of the book. Um, he says, I believe in the eternity of the faith. Um, so he's basically saying that we are not bound simply by the dictates of time. If we are bound by the dictates of time, then this limitless universe becomes a shrinking cage for us. And so he's, he's saying that we, are, we have a fundamental challenge in our understanding of time. We must look to timeless principles, not just um, those that are dictated by the fashions of time. And then he goes on, surrounded by a foreign fleet of cultural and ideological ships which have broken loose, a great phrase. He's, what he's describing here is the influence of Occidentalism in um, various ways. You know, I can think of the sort of degeneration in academia. I can think of, you know, post postmodernist uh, ways of deconstructing everything so that there is nothing left to build on, that sort of thing. These are ideologies. Um, and he, he says they're a fleet of cultural ships as well. And if we look particularly to the changes in culture, um, you know, when uh, President Obama entered his presidency to the time that he left his presidency, um, there was a major shift in culture in the United States. Um, we can see some of these battles being fought, out, fought in the courts in the United States. Um, so he was saying in 1976 that we have these, you know, cultural ideas that are going to challenge us. And then he asks, do we have a clear, firm, precise understanding of Muslim societies? What, what they are to be in the times to come. And he, he seeks the answer in the Holy Quran and in the example of the Sirah, of the life of the Holy Prophet. So we're living in a time where in W.B. Yeats's phrase, the center cannot hold, because there are a lot of centrifugal influences. And when that happens, we're in danger of losing our moral compass. So where, from where do we draw our moral sustenance? Mm -hmm. Well, the Imam rejects the ideas of relativism, moral relativism, of Occidental ideology, of time-limited values, and he points instead to the eternal values of the Holy Quran and the Prophet as the model of the perfect man. He points to the values of, of the limitless mirror of eternity, uh, the universe, uh, instead of those of the shrinking cage of time, the overcrowded island, as he says. With, with all of that in mind, how do you think the Imam's vision of having an integrated set of faith and ethics, how do you think that equips us to stand up to these changes of a modern world uh, and be thoughtful about it? Well, it's essential. Um, 
to have an integrated view of faith and ethics, because for that integration to occur, we have to understand the um, spiritual dimension. We have to understand that what truly connects us and what then informs our values is a deeper set of principles that cannot be gained simply by looking at the fashions or looking at um, you know, even materialistic science. Let me just say something about science over here, because I think it's important. The world is so influenced by particularly te technologies. You know, we have wonderful technologies, including this Zoom technology that we're all using at the moment. Um, but uh, one of the things that can happen is that technology can mesmerize us and make us think that science is the panacea. Science is the answer to everything. Um, but as Hajimam has said, and I quote this passage in the book somewhere, that science cannot answer questions of an ultimate nature. And let me just give you three very fundamental examples of the kinds of question that science cannot answer. Firstly, it cannot answer Leibniz's question, the philosopher Leibniz. Why is there something rather than nothing? The second question it can't answer is that even if we assume, okay, let's just say that there is something, why is some of that something animated? What is the difference between life and matter? Where does life come from? Mm. As opposed to why is there something at all? Why is there life? That's the second question it can't answer. And the third question it can't answer is that even if you assume that there is matter and some of it is animated, what is consciousness? And consciousness is not something that is capable of being reduced merely to, you know, uh, neurons and chemicals and uh, reactions of that kind. Consciousness is far more profound. We are living in the realm of artificial intelligence, which you know, uh, engages us with all kinds of questions about what it means to be human. We're one of you know, a few volumes of Sacred Web ago, I wrote an essay called um, on transhumanism. Um, and uh, you may, your audience may want to seek that out. It's on my Sacred Web website. It was actually quoted at the end of the uh, Nova uh, AKU conference uh, by um, uh, Firoz Rasul in his closing remarks at the conference in Lisbon. This was around the time that the Catholic Church, the Vatican, was getting engaged with the idea of transhumanism as well. Uh, what does it mean to be human when um, we are being um, redefined, our machines are redefining us? Um, now, I've sort of gone down this rabbit hole over here because I wanted really to make the point that um, we should not be mesmerized by science. Science deals with matters that it can only address from a quantitative point of view. It leaches out of all its answers anything that is truly qualitative. And it is the qualitative element precisely that we have um, uh, addressed by, by faith, by religion. It gives us a meaning for our lives, a sense of purpose. It tells us about values. Um, science can't do that. So, um, yeah, that's, that's what I, I just wanted to make that comment about science. Yeah, I appreciate that. I'm also curious from, from the research that you've done and, and the literature you've read, I'm curious for some examples in which the way the Ismaili Mamad has implemented these value systems that you've referred to um, through creating and enabling an environment for progress that's really aimed towards the common good or, or developing a better quality of life. What are some examples of, of that being done? Well, uh, we only have to look at the uh, AKDN institutions as an example of that. Focus, for example, is uh, heavily engaged with the white helmets at the moment in 
helping out in Turkey and, uh, and Syria, for, for instance. Uh, that's a current example. But let me give you one that I have, uh, you know, a personal familiarity with. Uh, uh, when introducing me, you mentioned that I headed the uh, Ismaili Personal Law Task Force for ICAP. And one of the projects that um, uh, we engaged in was the writing of a set of guidelines for ethical wealth transfer and, in, and inheritance planning. Mm -hmm. um, I, had a meet, I had a meeting with my task force and Hazrimam. We met um, in uh, January 2020, three years ago, um, uh, in Aiglemont, um, where we uh, basically discussed uh, the issues with the Imam. And let me just tell you a little bit about how the impetus for all of this was ethical. Um, in the work that uh, the Conciliation Arbitration Board does, it also analyzes why we get disputes. And it was becoming clear that a lot of disputes centered around the question of wealth. Um, who owns the wealth? You know, what obligations does the owner of the wealth have to distribute it in a, in a particular way? Um, and as these disputes were happening, Hazrimam uh, was very concerned that we should have a set of policies, a set of guidelines that will reduce pain and conflict for the Jamaats. And so how to go about that and what would be our uh, objectives at the end? Well, the objectives were clearly ethical, honorable living, improving the quality of life, nobody should get left behind, but also to indicate that when we approach the idea of wealth, we should un understand wealth to be a gift from God, that we should understand that we were stewards of that wealth, just like we are stewards of our lives, of the world around us. We need to care for that wealth and use it in ways that promote human dignity. Mm. And, and so the idea was, that um, when we leave our wealth to others, we should discharge moral obligations. That meant, for example, uh, honoring gender parity or gender equity as a premise. I know that that is different to the inheritance verses of the Holy Quran, but it is within the spirit and ethos of the Holy Quran um, in, in the Ismaili interpretation. Um, and similarly, when we are discharging our duties, we should not just look simply to, you know, prescribed categories of uh, beneficiaries, um, uh, you know, our, our next of kin in a narrow sense. We must look to benefit those who would have a reasonable moral expectation to be benefited. So it is this, you know, broad approach um, that is informing the policies of the ethical wealth transfer guidelines that I, I drafted. Um, and you can see there a perfect example of ethics in action. Thank you for sharing that. I'm keeping an eye on the time to be both respectful of your time and to get to our, our audience's questions that are coming in. So I'd like to ask one final question before jumping into some of the questions our audience has posed. How would you describe the Imam's legacy? And how do you think we can be part of that legacy? Well, I, I took a stab at this uh, in the last chapter of my book. Um, you know, I didn't want to be impertinent. We have a living Imam mm -hmm. who is, you know, um, still engaging in what we can call a work in progress. And yet, and so it seems a bit impertinent to be talking about the legacy uh, in that context. Uh, yet, as of the time we're speaking now, we have some, you know, 65 years of his track record to discern what I would call a moral trajectory um, uh, and, and the benefits to the Jamaat that um, we can see through that moral trajectory. Um, I would say that there are three clear legacies the first is the legacy of his ideas. He is a visionary thinker. 
um, some of the ideas that um, we've spoken about today um, uh, all fall into what I would call and have termed in the book, the theme of global convergence, of bringing people together, of the theme of brotherhood, sisterhood, um, of, of a united Jamaat and a united Ummah and a common humanity. Um, the second is that he has been an institutional builder. He has been, to my estimation, as I say in the book, the greatest builder of institutions uh, in the Ismaili history since Imam Moyes. Um, uh, he has built institutions that are, you know, adapted to our needs. When we think of the um, Jamaat where it was spread and what was known about it at the beginning of the Imamat and uh, how it has evolved, all the different needs that it has had, financial crisis needs from various times we've had, you know, the Imam has uh, had to engage with the Jamaats in times of war, for example, in some countries, Afghanistan, Syria, for instance. Um, and he has had to manage through the institutions to respond to their needs. So he's given us a global constitution in 1987. Um, he has given us the AKDN institutions, which he describes as a connector, an east-west connector um, on cultural matters and a north-south connector uh, on matters of um, finance economy to try and create a, uh, a more egalitarian drama to enable people to live honorably uh, so that they can practice the ethics of the faith and the institutions are a way of practicing the ethics of the faith. So that's the second legacy as an institution builder. The third legacy I would say is that he has been a bridge builder. A bridge builder, as I just mentioned, between East and West, North and South. Um, but more than that, in terms of institutional work, in his messages to the Jamaat, he has also been, and, and wider than the Jamaat, he has been an instiller of hope um, as a way to build bridges. And he has encouraged people to uh, uh, take on the responsibility of replacing fear and despair with hope in their own lives. So I think that is how I would describe his legacy. How do you, uh, what are some ways that we as a larger population can in, be part of that legacy, you think? Well, as far as uh, his ideas are concerned, to internalize them, to embrace them, uh, to embrace his vision, to see how uh, in our small ways, based on our capacities, we can join in his work, which is humanistic work, either through the institutions or if one prefers through other institutions uh, or just working on one's own, essentially uh, in his phrase, to live the ethics of our faith. Hmm. There are a number of audience questions that have that have come in, and speaking of uh, what you just mentioned of how we can engage in this legacy, one that stands out to me is, um, I'll just read it as, as it came in, the Imam has mentioned that the Western Jamaat is individualistic. Can you tell us about how you understand this particular characteris characterization of the Jamaat in opposition to the Muslim aim to be integrative in the spirit of Tawheed? Yes, it's a very good question. So let's just understand firstly that um, in Islam, individuality is celebrated. Mm. Individualism, however, is not. So we need to understand the difference between those terms. Um, when we come into the world, we come in with the gifts and endowments that God has loaned to us. We are each unique individuals. We each come with a set of gifts that defines us and that we want to express in order to be ourselves and express our individuality 
in life. And that is a good thing. That is something that is encouraged in Islam. But as with freedom, this expression of individuality cannot be transgressive. When it becomes transgressive, when it crosses certain lines, when it becomes only for the sake of enhancing one's ego, only for the sake of self-aggrandizement, and it loses that sense of humility that we were talking about earlier at the beginning of, the, of this talk, um, then uh, that freedom, that individuality becomes transgressive. It cuts itself off from the common good. And so the idea of using one's individuality in a pluralistic way of you know, celebrating diversity uh, in order to respect uh, that we each have something to offer as individuals for that common good is what is key. Mm -hmm. um, but individualistic Jamaats, yes. I would say that there are, particularly in the West, certain tendencies that Hajimam was warning of in the Sirat conference message that have come to pass. And increasingly we are seeing in our societies greater, a greater sense of polarization, a greater sense of um, loyalty to uh, camps rather than loyalty to principles. Mm. Thank you for elaborating on that. For our audience listening, uh, I am going to shift over into some of the audience questions received. Um, and before that, thank you so much, Ali, for all of your insights and your time so far in this conversation. This has been very insightful. Um, for any anybody who has a few extra minutes to stick around for some of the audience questions here, I have a few in front of me that I'd like to pose if I can have a little bit more of your time, Ali, if that's okay. Yes, of course. How do you differentiate between ethics and morals? What's its relationship to taqwa? And are these perennial or relative to culture and time? Uh, so I touched on this a little bit to say that ethics is different from morals in that ethics uh, entails having an ethos and that ethos is the sense of the whole, the whole that is greater than the sum of its parts, the sense that we're all interconnected. When I was drafting the ethical wealth transfer guidelines, I used a phrase there to uh, encapsulate the idea of ethics. And it's, it's three words, but I think it's a very key phrase, connectedness and caring. So ethics is about the caring that comes from our deep connectedness. It is what Hajimam refers to as empathy. And he says that we can bridge empathy gaps by filling knowledge gaps. That is another key one of his messages. Uh, the last part of that question, I just want to make, uh, make it very clear that um, it's not a matter of convention. Uh, ethics and morals are not a matter simply of convention. It is a question of deeper engagement than that. It's not, uh, you know, subject to the fashions of time. You, you mentioned the ethical wealth transfer and, and there is a question tied to that here. Can you speak to the idea of transference of wealth beyond our own limited ideas of transference? Uh, the understanding of what the notion of wealth signifies. Can you touch on that? Well, wealth, wealth as I said, is a gift. It is a gift from God, just like our lives, our bodies, everything is a gift from God. And so we have uh, the responsibility as God's stewards, Khalifa, this is the deep, deeper meaning of Khalifa. Uh, we have the obligation to um, husband our wealth. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the word uh, oikonomos, uh, from which the term eco economy or economics comes, uh, was, it, was a Greek term that referred to the person in a Greek household who would be responsible for the stewardship of wealth. Even the term husband, by the way, uh, which we all know about in, in the context of matrimony, 
actually has that connotation to husband one's wealth means to be somebody who is a khalifa, somebody who is a steward. And so the responsibility of the husband is to be the steward. So, um, you know, the, the, I guess the question was, uh, you know, what is the meaning of wealth, but the obligations of wealth, therefore, are to be tied to those to whom we have a moral obligation uh, to uh, protect and care for within our own circle. Um, and that's not just family members, it could be others that we have taken that moral obligation to, a caregiver, for example. Uh, but we have to make sure we discharge this obligation in ethical ways. So, you know, it's, this is not just simply a matter of following formulas. This is a question of engaging with what are our own needs, what are other people's needs, and how do we balance the obligations in such a way that everyone can live as optimally as possible a dignified life. Absolutely. Thank you for that. I think we have time for, for one more question that came through. Um, what prompted you to select the Court of Guyamers for the cover of your book? <laughs> um, well, you know, what happened was that um, the Institute of Ismaili Studies has uh, people that do their uh, graphic designing and they ran by me a number of graphics that I thought were very prosaic and mundane and I'm a bit picky, so <laughs> I rejected <laughs> every single be. one. <laughs> I rejected every single one that they gave me. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the Court of Kayumas was actually a feature piece uh, uh, owned by, uh, you know, Hajrimam's family. It was being featured by the Aga Khan Museum. I, I loved the piece. I had thought a lot about it. And I thought that, you know, the idea of the perfect man, uh, of the microcosm and the macrocosm and how we are all interlinked would be a good statement uh, to make about the main theme of the book. And, uh, and that's why I chose it. It's I quite pretty, it. isn't it? <laughs> it is, it is. I'm, I'm marveling it and was tempted to just hold it up the whole time. <laughs> I'm glad you like it. All right. Um, I think that brings us, yeah, that brings us to the end of our, our time together. Ali, this, thank you so much again for the time that you've offered to both having this conversation with me personally. I feel like I could unpack this with you for several more hours and thinking about the context of applying it to both my own life and my personal life, but also in the context of me being a teacher in my REC classrooms. Um, there's a lot of information here that is directly connected to the lessons and learnings that we are unpacking there as well. And audience, thank you so much for sticking with us this entire time and for joining us today. Hopefully this is just the beginning of this critical conversation for yourselves as well. And we appreciate you joining us on this Sunday afternoon. A couple of announcements before we, we part ways. In the chat, you'll find resources that are recommended by Ali, including a reading guide for the book, a link to purchase the book directly, Faith and Ethics, The Vision of Ismaili Imamath, again, is the title of it. Um, uh, Ali's own publication called Sacred Web, we'll place a link to that directly in the chat, as well as a link to an interview uh, at the Ismaili Center in Toronto, if you're interested in, in viewing that. And for any, um, any of our Urdu speaking audience members, there is an interview that Ali did in, in Urdu as well that we can paste the, the link to there, which is on, found on YouTube if you're interested in that. For the recording of this conversation, I know many of you are very eager for, for that recording, as well as recordings of past conversations, you can visit the Facets of Faith page on the.ismaili USA. We'll paste a link to that website in the chat. And for more information on upcoming conversations, our next critical conversation, please keep an eye out on the.ismaili slash USA, the webpage, as well as our social media pages for more information. And last but certainly not least, we are constantly trying to make sure that we are bringing to you the right conversations, the most interesting conversations that you have top of mind. And we would love for your feedback on what those are and how these are, are going for you as a whole. So as you exit, the, the webinar, you'll see a survey pop up on your screen. Please do take up the 30 seconds to provide us your feedback so we can make sure we're continuing 
these critical conversations that are critical to you. And with that, thank you so much again for joining us. Ali, again, thank you for your time. We really appreciate all that you've shared with us in the last hour and 15 minutes. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks, Farah. Thanks, Farhana. And I'd like to just thank all the organizers and everyone who attended and took the time to listen to this today. Thank you. Thank you.